hi everyone welcome back to my youtube channel i'm super excited to have you watching this video thank you so much for tuning in my name is mary i'm a practicing lawyer in nigeria and on this channel i share videos for laymen and also for lawyers if this is your first time of seeing my beautiful face please click on the subscribe button okay i'm a returning subscriber thank you for always coming back to watch my videos if you're here to subscribe please subscribe and like share this video <laughs> okay thank you so much so in today's video i'll be explaining how to institute an enforcement of fundamental rights suits in nigeria so this video is for everyone if you're a layman you're watching me this video is for you and if you're a lawyer this video is more for you so we all have um, 11 fundamental rights in nigeria that is sections um 33 to 43 of the 1999 constitution we have the right to life we have right to liberty um, freedom of movement um, a lot more um, privacy against discrimination um, peaceful assembly and all of that so we have 11 in total okay so um section 42 is provided that uh, when any of this right is being infringed about to be infringed or currently being infringed you can actually proceed to the court to seek for redress and that is what we'll be talking about in this video how can you go about it okay and if this video seems like something you're interested in please make sure you watch this video till the end <music> There is no limitation period as to when you can file or institute an enforcement of fundamental right. In other cases, the layman you're watching, what I mean is, other suits in Nigeria, you must um, file that suit between a particular period of time. Okay. For institution of fundamental rights, if any of those sections 33 to 43 is been, I will try and put um, all of those um, provision, all of those rights of the on the screen. So if any of this rights, if any of the rights has been infringed on, you don't need to, probably it happens five years ago, it's happened rather five years ago, you can still proceed to the court anytime to actually enforce your rights. However, I am of the opinion that it is far better to institute that action when it's still fresh because you need evidence, you need certain things to prove to the court. But by five years, it will be difficult to get evidence, okay? I know court, court will definitely grant you your claim based on how far you have been able to prove it, okay? So it is important that uh, we file it and that's when necessary. Although the law is there is no limitation period as to when you can file it. And another thing is fundamental rights to actually sue generis. If you're a lawyer, you're watching it. The applicable laws to every other suit is not are not necessarily applicable to um, fundamental rights. Okay, fundamental rights actually have a particular idea of its own rule. That is the fundamental rights enforcement procedure rules of 2009. So that is the purpose. So anything you need, everything in that particular purpose. Okay. So um, let's talk about it. I'll be talking about your drafting. By the way, if you need a precedent to file a um, fundamental right, you can drop a comment in the comment section and drop your email address or you send me um, a message via my email address and I'll be able to send one to you. So let's talk about drafting now. Who may sue? You as a lawyer, somebody have actually um, consulted you, consulted you and um, you're thinking, how do you go about it? Who may sue? The applicant, that is the person whose right has been infringed or likely to be infringed or currently being infringed, that person can be the applicant. According to the preamble in that first of 2009, it's provided that uh, about five type different people that can actually enforce and um, file an application. Okay, a member on behalf of the association can file. Um, someone on behalf of other persons can actually file. For example, if my sister's right has been infringed. I can actually file an enforcement of fundamental rights suit on behalf of my sister. So that is who may sue. Let's talk about court. This is the most uh, important. Every other aspect are actually important, but uh, jurisdiction is, is the bedrock of um, litigation in Nigeria. So let's talk about um, um, the jurisdiction of the courts. According to the FRAP rules, we have the High Courts, the State High Courts, and the Federal High Courts. And both have um, concurrent jurisdiction to entertain fundamental rights suits. And you know, jurisdiction in Nigeria, we check jurisdiction from three basic things. We check from parties, we check from territorial jurisdiction, and also subject matter. So let's use these three things to actually talk about jurisdiction of courts of both the state high courts, high courts and uh, the federal high courts. So uh, according to the, a lot of judicial authorities, fundamental rights suits 
any state where that infringement occurred that is the state that must try or hear that particular matter just like in every other cases um let us mean let's assume a land matter has actually occurred and on your state i thought in the would definitely be the um the applicable or the appropriate court to actually entertain that matter so if the infringement happens in abuja okay the state High Court or the Federal High Court would be the appropriate court to approach. So the territory. So we've been able to set to that. So I'll be talking about the subject matter now. So um, we all know, or let me say many lawyers actually are aware that any suit that you will file at the Federal High Court must be such that falls within Section 251 of the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended. That is it. So when you're approaching the Federal High Court for an enforcement of fundamental rights suit, you need to check the subject matter. Is it homicide? Is it murder? Does homicide or murder, does it fall um, within section 251 of the 1999 Constitution? No. Which means it's the High Court that will have jurisdiction. So that is how you will check. So once you, you just need to produce the facts very well and check what the subject matter is all about. Once the subject matter is such that falls within 251 or the 1999 Constitution, the appropriate court will be the Federal High Court. But if you can't find that subject matter in Section 251 or the 1999 Constitution, the State High Court will be the appropriate court to approach. But do not leave it there. Okay, you still need to check the third um, criteria, which is um, the parties. Uh, many lawyers were of the opinion that once one of the parties is a federal government agency or agent that uh, what the applicable, the appropriate court to approach the federal high court. Yes, I believe you're right, and um, that is the uh, that is actually what I also believe in. Okay, because section two five one sub H, there is a particular provision there that says when what you are um, applying for is an injunction or declaration that affects a federal government agent uh, agency or its agent, the appropriate court is. The federal high court that is actually what then that section 251 though there is a lot of controversy that um the fact that um it involves the federal it, it's um the action involves a federal government agent or agency it is that is not all about um you filing at federal high court. there are some judicial authorities that actually say that but i'm of the opinion that in as much as it falls between section 251 that but particularly r of that section 251 actually provides that if what you want to demand for for example if your brother has been arrested by the nigerian police okay and um, or let's say by the efcc so and the person is still in custody definitely you may want to approach the court for an enforcement of that person for that mental, for the mental rights to liberty okay and you will be, will be asking for um, an injunction that that person another of the court that the person should be released uh, forthwith and that um, an injunction that the efcc should be restrained perpetually from arresting your brother as relating to that subject matter okay so in that situation with the opinion that the federal high court is actually the appropriate court to approve Just make sure that you check very well section 251 of the 1999 constitution if your subject matter falls within uh, what is in there you can approach the federal high court for enforcement of that person's fundamental right so let's talk about the mode of application is it by breach of summons or by originating summons or by petition or by originating motion? Personally, I would use originating motion, but the prep rules actually provides that any mode of originating process that may be um, uh, that may be accepted by the court, okay? Which means it may come by breach of summons, so far the court accepts it. It may come by petition, so far the court accepts it. However, when I was in Nigerian law school, I was made to understand that um, the best mode is uh, by originating motion, and that is what I've been using and no objection from anywhere okay so you may also use by way of originating motion but do not forget that the prep rules do not specify any uh, form of application what the prep rules says is any mode of application that the courts may accept so another point is leave the issue of leave um the prep rules of the first prep prep rules i can't, can't remember the year before the 2009 so actually provides for seeking for leave from the court before um, instituting and enforcing the fundamental right. However, that has been abolished by the Fred Rules of 2009, which means you do not need to seek for leave before filing an action that borders on enforcement of fundamental rights. Okay, that is another point. And another important point, very, very important, okay, which on uh, this particular point, many primary objections that actually been raised. I've seen a lot of authorities 
where the court has actually decided on this, which is your prayer, your relief between section 33 to 34 of the 1999 constitution. That is, your main prayer must border on fundamental rights. You can't say you, can you are filing an enforcement of fundamental rights, and your first prayer is uh, a declaration that the, the applicant is the right holder of the land. That is not fundamental right, okay? So that's actually um, a lot of the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court that actually make a lot of decisions. You can have other, um, other release that may not be within that section 33, but it's section 33 to 34, section 33 to 34 of the 1999 decision. But it's important that your first relief, the main thing, the main the declaration, or whatever you'll be asking for the court, must be such that it's between within sections 33 and 43 of the 1999. It's very, very important. You not um, doing that, and actually the respondent may file a, a PO, and excuse me, before you know it, your matter will be out of the court, okay? So please do not forget that. Another part is um, your affidavit. According to the FREC rules, the FREC rules says the applicant shall be the deponent. When a situation where your applicant, probably a person is in custody of the DSS, of the EFCC, of the Nigerian police, you may um, write, you may be the applicant, you may be the deponent rather. Because I know many lawyers, we are fond of deposing to an affidavit on behalf of our clients because we don't want to stress them to come to court to come and sign as a deponent. I understand. But the, the first rules actually means what shall. Although to date I've not been uh, I've not seen any um any authority that says you not um, the applicants not being the deponent can actually make that application to the faulty. I haven't seen such. But because the first rules actually use the word shall so I'm very careful with that word. So if your applicant is out there, if, if he's not in detention, if he's not on a sick bed, please allow your applicant to be the deponent. It is important that the applicant should be the one to sign as a deponent. But when he is in custody or he cannot easily come to um, the court, you may, a brother, a sister, a relative, a lawyer, and actually depose to an affidavit on that person's behalf. So you can as well file an affidavit of urgency if you want that matter to be assigned as soon as possible. Well, fundamental right cases, fundamental enforcement of fundamental right cases are always given a, a sort of priority. Like um, assess, assignment officers are always so fast about assigning such cases, okay? Assigning your such cases to court. And the court also give them, I give cases like that I regard. Um, about two weeks ago, I filed the one and uh, so it was assigned. Before I knew it, within the same week, I was given a date. I actually don't know anybody. I did not sort anybody for anything. But I believe, I actually love that job because the first day, appearing the first time in court, um, the first thing that my Lord actually has this is the person still in detention. So which means the court is actually very considerate, okay? So you can put an affidavit of urgency in that. And um, if you are filing at the Federal High Court, it may be necessary for you to file an affidavit of non-multiplicity of suits. That is actually being demanded um, for in Abuja. Yeah. So I don't know for other jurisdictions. So let's talk about filing. It is important that if you have five applicants, do not lump the applicants by using one um, originating application, originating process. If you have five people, five persons that have been detained, each of them must have a separate application. Enforcement of fundamental rights is just one person by process, okay? So don't make that mistake. By putting one app five applicants in one process, the respondent can actually file, uh, can actually file um, preliminary objection before you know it's a matter you have to the court. So separate application for each of the applicants. Let's talk about service. So you serve through the court's um, belief just like any, every other cases and uh, service is, according to the first rules, service is meant to be done directly, directly on the respondent or through their agents. Me, I do um, serve, for example, if I want to serve a first bank PLC, I don't know their juristic um, name now. So if something, if I want to serve them, I can actually serve the Abuja branch. I, I think the headquarters is actually in Lagos. Since the first rules actually provided that one can serve through the agent, of the um, respondent, so I do serve the um, what, what's it called now? The their the agents in Abuja, and I've, I've never gotten any objection as a result of that. Now, let's talk about hearing. Okay, on the first day, it is possible for the court to say the matter is coming up for mention. I've seen that, and I've seen some situation that the court will give a priority to the case being an enforcement of fundamental rights and jump the part of the uh, mention and delve into the subject matter. So there is actually a provision in the first rules that talks about um, application by ex party. 
So you can actually approach the court to hear you by way of ex party, that is, the other party will not be put to notice if exceptional action will be caused on the applicant pending the time the service will be done. Okay, so if service will take a longer time and you feel a lot of things might go wrong before service can be done, so you can apply to the court that the court can hear you, may it should hear you by way of ex party, okay, and you provide your reasons in your affidavit to convince the court. So, after mention on the day of hearing, or let me talk about the premier objection, it's possible that the respondent can file premier objection. So, I, I can't prevent what the premier objection will be, will be all about, but um, if you're responding and you're watching this video, please note that if you're filing a premier objection in front uh, fundamental rights suit, you have to file the premier objection together with the counter affidavit in your as response to that, um, to the application to the originating uh, process, okay. And you, as the applicant, by receiving that, you also to file you can file a reply. Okay, and also file a counter affidavit to their premier objection. And on the day of hearing, you will just move your application the way you move your motion. I have a video about how to move your motion, so that is how we just talk about your application. Okay, and you can underbrate. It is important. It is possible that the court will give you opportunity to underbrate and interrupt the court's um, vital information, and um, you can also bring to notice of the court some cases probably you not capture them in your in your application to actually convince the mind of the court. It is possible that the premier objection uh, may bother on things like um, failure to comply with um, time, place and manner. So there is a provision in the referral process that says such will be treated as an irregularity. Okay, um, The courts are actually very careful when it comes to enforcement of fundamental rights. So they wouldn't want anybody to actually use some some um, technicality to actually knock it out okay so when it comes to place time or manner anything you feel you did not um, do well okay you can just use that provision of the fair pros and say that will be treated as um, an irregularity okay i hope this video educates you if you have any question please drop it in the comment section i don't really know if there's something i did not capture so you can drop a comment in the comment section and if you need a precedent you can send me a message via my email address in order for me to send same to you if you enjoyed this video please like and share if you're a lawyer a new week and you enjoyed this video you can share with uh, other people in any platform you belong to um, in order to just up them and also like this video thank you so much for watching and i will see you in another video